a voice cries out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Isaiah 40, verse 3. The prophet Isaiah wrote these words approximately 540 years before the birth of Christ. For 540 years, God's people waited. That's like 18 generations that God's people read these words and recited them to their children and passed them along to future generations. It's a lot of sermons. It's a lot of Sunday school lessons. It's a lot of dinner blessings. For 540 years, God's people waited for God to show up. Last week in her children's message, Kat asked the kids to share a time when they had waited for something. Now, I know that my daughter, Esme, can hardly wait to open the door of her advent calendar every morning when she wakes up. In fact, she is two, and she actually can't wait. And so I have to keep the advent calendar out of her reach, or all 24 of the doors would have been opened back in November. Charlotte shared that she has to wait to see her friend, who she doesn't often get to see. Antonio said that he waits on daddy to get home from work each night. A few adults even shared times that they waited for babies to be born. This morning, the world waits for a vaccine. Waiting is a universal human experience, isn't it? But as people of God, we are called by God not only to wait, but also to get ready. God's people are called to prepare for God to come. Just like the prophet Isaiah said, we are called to prepare the way of the Lord. That's exactly what John the Baptist does in Mark chapter 1. Hear these words again. John the baptizer appeared in the wilderness, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And people from the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem were going out to him and were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair, with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. He proclaimed, The one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. John knew that he was one of God's people. And as one of God's people, John knew that God had called him to prepare the way for God to show up in the world. This morning, I'm going to highlight three ways that John the Baptist prepared the way for Jesus to be born in Bethlehem. And I'm going to invite us to consider how we are called in our context, in our world, to prepare for Christ to return again. The first thing that John the Baptist did to prepare the way for Christ is that he went out into the wilderness. Verse 4 says, John the baptizer appeared. In the wilderness. He left the places where he had been and he showed up in a place that was uncomfortable, unfamiliar, and unpredictable. This is exactly in accordance with what was prophesied in Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3. In the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. 
preparing for Christ begins in the wilderness, in the desert. It requires getting up from our comfortable places and going out into spaces that are deserted, neglected, and desolate. God's people are called to prepare for Christ by leaving our places of comfort and going out into wilderness spaces. Yesterday, the... Excuse me. Yesterday and today, the teens of our church are holding a coat drive to benefit people who are experiencing homelessness this winter in Boston. They're doing this because a couple of years ago, on a weekend in early January, they participated in a homelessness education program called City Reach, where they met and formed relationships with people who live on the streets and in the shelters of Boston. And they saw firsthand the way that people survive, sleeping in cardboard boxes, waiting in long lines at soup kitchens, and depending on the warmth of coats and blankets donated by strangers like yourselves. By attending this program, giving up a Friday night and a Saturday when they could have been having sleepovers or going out with friends, the teens left the comfort of their lives in Lemonster, and they went somewhere that they had never been before, somewhere unknown, somewhere uncomfortable, somewhere neglected and ignored, the wilderness. After attending City Reach, they decided to spend a winter night sleeping outside in cardboard boxes themselves. They ate dinner out of tin cans, They huddled together in sleeping bags. The leaders who organized the event told me later that they had set up a warming station for the kids inside the church building if they got too cold. And not a single teen chose to use it that night. By leaving the comfort of their homes and lives and going out into the wilderness, the teens prepared the way for Christ. Their time in the wilderness moved their hearts with compassion and their hands to action. Because they went out into the wilderness, the wilderness moved them to hold a coat drive. And because they held a coat drive, a handful of men and women living on the streets of Boston are going to survive another winter. And because a handful of men and women on the streets of Boston are going to survive another winter, the streets of Boston are going to be a little less harsh and deadly this year. And because the streets of Boston are going to be a little less harsh and deadly this year, the world itself will look a little bit more prepared to welcome Jesus back. Preparing for Christ, preparing for Christmas, begins in the wilderness. The second way that John the Baptist prepared the way for the very first Christmas is that he pointed away from himself and to Christ. John was a popular guy. The Gospels tell us that people traveled long distances to hear him speak, and they stood in long lines to be baptized by him in the Jordan River. Surely John was tempted to get a big head about his popularity and fame. Surely from time to time he entertained thoughts of how amazing he was. He was only human. But in the end, John resisted the temptation to pride. He deliberately pointed away from himself, and he pointed to Jesus. In verse 7, John proclaims, The one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. John prepared the way for Jesus by giving the glory and attention to God and not himself, even when he could have taken it. 
In my experience, one of the biggest pitfalls of humanitarian work or justice work or compassion work or any kind of mission work really is the temptation to mistake ourselves for for saviors. It's the temptation to forget that Jesus is the savior, not me, not you, not us. How many times have we seen videos and images depicting American Christians, usually white American Christians, traveling to faraway lands to quote unquote bring the gospel to people who are poor, often people whose skin is a darker shade than their own? That's not called mission work, beloved. That's called a white savior complex. And I wish it wasn't true, but I know it very well. How many times have we believed that a new president would save the country? How many times have we believed that a new pastor would save the church? How many times have we been disappointed to discover that our hoped for saviors were actually just humans, even if really good humans? full of limitations and shortfalls, just like you and me. True Christian leaders, true preparers of the way of Christ, know that they are laborers, not saviors. They resist the temptation to point to themselves and they point toward Christ. The reason why I applaud the teens of our church for attending the homelessness education program in Boston is because it was an education program. Yes, by going to Boston, they helped people. They helped distribute hundreds of coats and hats and blankets to people experiencing homelessness actively on the streets. But at the same time, I would argue that the people experiencing homelessness helped our teens just as much, if not more, than our teens helped them. They weren't there to be saviors. They were there to be learners. They were there to be listeners. They weren't there to point to themselves and say, look what good people we are. No. They were there to point to Christ and the beloved community that Christ is building through his redeeming work of healing and restoration in our world. This is what it means to prepare for Christ's return, to join in with the work that God is doing in the world, remembering that we are not the saviors, we are the laborers, and only God can save us. The third way that John the Baptist prepared for Christ was through repentance. The Gospels tell us that John proclaimed a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. The word repent literally means to change your mind. Earlier this year, a member of our congregation shared with me, and and she gave me permission to share with you today, that she had decided to quit her job and start her own business. She had been quite successful building her career with the company that she worked for. But she came to a point where she realized that the sacrifices that her job required of her own health and her own family simply were not worth it anymore. So she changed her mind. She changed her career. She repented. She stopped going down one path and she started going down another. God's people are called to prepare for Christ by changing our minds about all of the broken, harmful, and dysfunctional ways that we live and choosing instead to live in God's way, on God's path of grace and healing and restoration. The writer of 2 Peter 
explains that repentance is not only a means of preparing for Christ's return, but it is also the reason why it's taking so long. Repentance is the reason for the delay. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9 says, The Lord is not slow about his promise, his promise to return, that is. The Lord is not slow about his promise, as some think of slowness, but is patient with you, not wanting any to perish, but all to come to repentance. In other words, the reason why Jesus hasn't come back yet is that God is waiting on us to repent. God is waiting patiently, so patiently, for all human beings to prepare the way for him by turning from their death-dealing ways and walking instead in the way of life. Beloved, this Advent, we wait in the wilderness, in repentance, in the humility of realizing that we are not saviors, and yet we are called to prepare the way for the Savior. Amen.